coming up. The decline of disruptive innovation. Looking at the lighter side of science communication. A complicated future for cultivated meat. And cashing in on precision fermentation. We're celebrating the best of omnivore. From the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT's new Product Development Bootcamp, a comprehensive 10-module online course designed to equip food and beverage professionals with the knowledge and skills necessary to elevate and accelerate product development. Learn more at ift.org bootcamp. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we're celebrating our first anniversary throughout December with a look back at some of our favorite and most popular segments of 2023. I'm your host, Bill McDowell. Rabobank Senior Consumer Food Analyst Tom Bailey says the age of disruption is over, at least for now. And that's partly because some of the recent food and beverage disruptions haven't proven to be all that investors had hoped for. Earlier this fall, Bailey shared his thoughts on what innovation will look like in the years ahead in this conversation with Food Technologies Executive Editor, Mary Ellen Kuhn. Well, welcome to the Omnivore Podcast, Tom. In a recent report you wrote, you asked the question, is the age of food disruption over? And I'd say that based on your report, your answer is yes, at least for now. Is that an accurate take on your perspective? And could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So... Based on the insights and patterns that we we looked at, it seems that you know there was clearly a frenzied era of disruption in, in food, and it's taking taking a breather uh, is is safe to say. Uh, the past decade, we saw a surge of these disruptive innovations. All you have to do is go to Expo West, and you'll see a lot of cool, exciting new disruptive products. Recently, we've definitely seen a, a recalibration towards incremental innovation. Um, and it stems from changes to all of these tailwinds we saw driving disruptive innovation, um, you know, from a, a shift in the supply chain, just getting, just securing products of, for packaging or ingredients for flavors. That that has all changed. I um, mean, it still remains a challenge for a lot of companies. So that's, you know, a very basic aspect that is, has shifted. But we've also seen a change in the consumer behavior. So consumers are a little more choosy about what they want to buy and they're they're penny pinching a bit more given the the financial environment. Um, so we've seen a change in that. And also I think that we've, we've learned, and we'll probably talk more about it, um, their appetite for some of these products. Um, but the financial markets also, and I think that this is an important one, the financial markets have shifted. So a higher interest rate is gonna change the way that a lot of these startups are, value, are, are valued from an um, investment standpoint. And that, that changes the appetite also. But I think it's important, and I'll just leave it at, at this uh, to underline that while the intensity has dampened a little bit, disruptive innovation is by no means extinct. It's just taking a backseat for the time being. Well, that's a good point. And maybe we could talk a little bit more about what that means, because I did have a question about innovation as things change. What are you forecasting for innovation in the, in the food and beverage industry? So I think we're we're already seeing it by and large. We're you know the the innovation is shifting to very pragmatic, consumer led products being being developed. So basic basic in, incremental innovations. So we're talking flavor changes or or slight format changes or packaging changes and things of that nature. So you know cheese it's not, have a puffed cheese it, which would be an incremental you know, innovation that's much more simple for the consumer to grasp from a new product standpoint. But we've also seen, you know, some of the big names specifically calling out a purposeful shift towards incremental innovation. And that would be, you know, McDonald's has said that, that they're going to focus on their their core menu and their core successful products. And that's going to be focusing on quality of the burgers. So juicier, more flavorful, traditional Big Macs. They're going to also do a chicken Big Mac. But we also seen Chobani shift and, and call out specifically they're going to be looking at um, incremental innovations after massive, you know, prolific category expansion. Um, bring it back to the to the core products that they do well and look at how they can build upon those that align with the consumer. 
Well, I wanted to ask you if the age of disruption has has ended or or tailed off a bit for now. Is there a defining word for the food and beverage market for the next decade? Yeah, I, that's a that's a a good question. I I should have probably used this word in the report, but I think the defining word would be refinement. So the next decade, we're going to see you know the the brands refining their offerings, which I've kind of just talked about a little bit, um, focusing on improving those flavors, textures, and and those points. Also, personalization of products and and flavors, I think, is going to be interesting for consumer brands, for restaurants and foods, quick service restaurants specifically. I think that that personalization means a lot to, to today's consumer, particularly millennials and Gen Z. They love that personalized story. Well, I just ask you to look forward. So if I could take you back and just ask you about the past decade, what disruptive product or product category would you say has been the most overrated? Yeah, that's an easy one. I feel bad picking on them so much, but I think that the alternative meats really, I personally, I wanted to see them succeed. I wanted to love it. I wanted it to take off, but it just, you know, frankly, up front, it didn't taste great, but to give it some credit, they did shift and create a novel way of thinking about protein sources and sustainability specifically. But I think that it it really created a significant amount of hype and overinvestment that just outpaced the adoption rates from consumers themselves, contrast that with alternative milks, uh, which I think that the alternative meats assume they would have a similar sort of adoption rate with the consumers where alternative milks are up, up to 20% of the total milk category now was a quiet winner. They, they are loud now. You know, you have the Oatly ads coming out and being quite antagonistic towards the dairy industry now. Um, but they've already got a strong foothold in the traditional milk category. So they've kind of got room to, to, to make those claims. They, they can back them up by their presence in the category. Alternative meats, just they, they don't have that yet. They didn't catch on. Um, and they, they came in screaming. And it was, almost, it was almost an over oversell, under deliver story versus milks, which were undersell. Yeah, I guess that whole idea of Overpromise and underdeliver is never a good thing. Yeah, that's tricky. Well, you mentioned the alternative milk products. Are there any other products that have kind of emerged in the past decade or so that you do you find impressive? Yeah, so there, there there's a lot kind of on the fringe of would be disruptive. You know, some of the products that I that I do like were some of the fermented foods, especially you know products like kombucha, kefir. You know, these were these are twist. They are somewhat disruptive to traditional cat- beverage category and traditional uh, drinkable yogurt category. But they bring together that unique blend of taste, the health side of things, and traditional food practices. On the lines of truly disruptive to food, I'd say precision fermentation specifically is it hasn't done very well. You know, to date, they've raised a lot of money. They haven't had any big wins with a specific branded product or integration as an ingredient into big, big food brands specifically. But I do think that they're going to have a place in the supply chain. And I, I do think that, you know, products like infant formula, for example, there's, there's a big need for some of these very specific ingredients that aren't found in nature outside of the human that we've been trying to replicate through, you know, through manufacturing processes that precision fermentation can nail. And it's, it's, it belongs in there. I think that we're going to see precision fermentation come out and actually be do very well. Interesting. So I wanted to go back to something you touched on as, as we started in the whole access to venture capital. I think everyone agrees that there's going to be less of it. So what kind of investment opportunities will venture capitalists be seeking out in this time period? Ah, that's a, a very good question. And we we talk about it a lot. You know, I work in a in a bank at the end of the day, um, and there's a lot of discussion around where's where's the money going to go, and how how are companies going to be valuing specifically venture capital, which I think is has been driving a lot of the the investment. They're still going to be looking at disruptive innovation. They're they're going to be the stopgap. So what? So let me step back. I think the large corporates got very excited by disruptive innovation. So they, they developed incubators and they were uh, investing a lot towards disruptive products. 
I think that those incubators and those investments and that focus is, is going to be more geared around incremental. I think they're going to leave the disruptive, the higher risk stuff to the venture capital firms, private equity groups, and some of those kind of outsourcing that the disruptive um, investments. So the VC firms, venture capital firms are going to be the stopgap for that disruptive innovation. So they're going to continue to incubate that. But I think they're going to be doing less of it because they don't have they, they can't take the risks they could over the last decade or so because the cost of money has just gone up. So you have to be very, very careful. You need to be looking you know, for investments that have very clear value proposition, a, a solid business model, you know, demonstrated market traction already, not just a pie in the sky theory, you know, something that's actually look, that's going to be you know, demonstrating traction with the consumer in terms of the financial metrics that I think that they'll be looking for. Well, thank you so much, Tom. These are great insights and we're very appreciative of them. Tom Bailey is a senior consumer foods analyst with Rabobank. Learn more about what he's forecasting for the food industry in the October issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. Introducing IFT's Product Development Bootcamp, a comprehensive 10-module online course designed to equip food and beverage professionals with the knowledge and skills necessary to elevate and accelerate product development. Whether you're new to product development or need a refresh on the basics, IFT's Product Development Bootcamp offers a wealth of valuable insights, practical strategies, and real-world examples to take your product development to the next level. Learn more at ift.org slash bootcamp. Welcome back to the best of Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. Food is an intimate, political, and emotionally charged topic. So it's never been more important for scientists to separate fact from fiction. Unfortunately, a lot of scientists still struggle to simplify complex information and connect with a broader audience. Last June, I spoke with Laura Lindenfeld, Executive Director of the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science, about how acting techniques, specifically improv theater, can help build better connections. Laura, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, can you briefly explain the origin story of the Alan Alda Center? What makes it unique? Alan Alda, wonderful actor, writer, director. He worked on Scientific American Frontiers. He interviewed scientists and he noticed that when he could get them to make a connection with them, they would convey their work and talk about science in ways that were so compelling and interesting. And it occurred to him, what if we used improvisational theater to help scientists communicate? And Alan being the creative genius that he is, went around the greater Northeast and looked at universities and said, hey, would you be interested in having me help train scientists? And Stony Brook University here on Long Island, New York, where I live, said, yes, that's, let's give it a whirl. And that's how the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science was born. So talk a little bit about the underlying need that this is addressing. And, and when we were speaking about a month ago for the food technology interview, you mentioned this concept about the curse of knowledge as being a barrier for scientists to be able to effectively communicate. Can you elaborate a little bit on what that means and, and how your training addresses that? When you're trained to be an expert in something, you learn really specific language and ways of thinking and communicating about your work. And what happens is you lose distance from what it feels like not to know all that information and not be really inculcated into that culture. We call that the curse of knowledge. It sounds, it sounds scary and frightening. It's not about knowledge being bad. It's, it's really about what does it feel like not to know what you know so well? When you lose that distance, you tend to communicate about things in ways that reach the others who, who, who are experts like you, and it leaves so many people behind. 
So along those lines, can you talk a little bit about the role of empathy in science communication and how do these training programs foster that? Yeah, we use improvisational theater. We literally get STEM professionals, scientists in the room and we use improvisational theater exercises to help people form connection. And to me, what's at the core of communication is not about me getting perfect words that are always going to land perfectly on you or, or on any given audience, but really for us to be able to imagine, as the experts in this case, what do others need from us so that we can have a conversation that moves ideas forward? And the way to do that is through empathy. Imagining what it feels to be someone else. Imagining what it feels to be talking to someone like me and putting myself in their shoes so that we can forge a connection and move the conversation. Can you paint a little bit of a picture of what some of these exercises look like? I mean, how does this, how does this work on a practical level? Yeah, in a practical level, so we do this in person and online. I'll, I'm going to talk about in person. Imagine you come into a room and there's 16 to 20 scientists and a couple of uh, specialists from the Alda Center who are trained to do this work. And we get you up on your feet and we teach you two rules. Number one, you got to say yes and. That's the first rule of improv. Accept the reality of the situation and make it move forward. And we tell you, you have to make your partner look good. Whatever it is you do, whether you believe or disbelieve uh, this person, you've got to accept their humanity and dignity. And we have you doing all kinds of exercises where you may be mirroring each other or uh, playing around with ideas. There's, there's such an element of play and joy to this whole process. And it helps you more and more throughout the day be able to put yourself empathically in the shoes of that other person and figure out ways to communicate that forge genuine connections. So you wind up learning that listening is the most important part of communication. And you learn to communicate in ways that help you be heard rather than thinking, oh, that person didn't hear me. That's their fault. So you bring these people in and you work with them over a day, a couple of days. How do you measure success or impact? Is there any kind of a follow-up mechanism or is it primarily anecdotal on site? Typically, it's a, a full day. Sometimes it's two days. Uh, the exercises are scaffolded. We talk about that in learning sciences so that things build on each other. It's like building muscles at the gym. Um, you make your biceps strong, then you make your shoulders strong, and you can lift some really heavy weights. So we build that over one to two days. How do we assess that? We get feedback about the workshops. We also have, and I, I can't really share this with you yet because it's not done, but we have a large study that's looking at how does improv being used with scientists affect their ability to communicate and how do audiences then perceive that communication. So I'm going to ask you to switch gears for a second, because in addition to being executive director of the Alda Center, you're also the dean of the journalism school at Stony Brook. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the bridge between these two, because you know the world's only getting more complicated. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Can you address the role of the media in this equation, within the role of the media in combating misinformation? And what what can we be doing to better prepare these professional communicators? What I love about having the, you know, the full spectrum of communication and journalism research and practice in the school and center is that we're, we're able to help have our students here at the school learn how to produce media about science, go to experts to get stories and produce content designed for the audiences that they want to reach. One thing I think is really, really critical, and you would know this yourself, is to, to understand who are the audiences you serve. Not everybody has the same needs. And to be able to um, bring that empathy that we use in the communication training to bear on how we produce media so that the content we want to bring across, accurately vetted journalistic content and other forms of media that are really compelling, but that it really is designed to land with that audience so people can make sense of information and use it in their lives. I want to circle back for a second about when you were talking about 
the role of empathy and putting yourself in the in the shoes of the person that you're that you're speaking with when you really take an audience seriously and you really put yourselves to the best of your ability into their shoes you have to think about what it feels like to be them and what they might remember people are inundated by a lot of information i mean how many channels and sources and messages do we get all day long it's very easy to forget when you're communicating to be heard rather than communicating what you want to say it changes how you go about that communication it changes the content the tone the style that's really what we're after it's helping you you know if you're a scientist helping you convey uh, messages in such a way that they're memorable and impactful What's your long-term vision? How do you see the center's role evolving as the future in the future as you know public perception of science and the role of communication science continues to change? I've been thinking recently, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, science is amongst the most amazing, remarkable, profound things that we as a civilization have created. We've created music, art, literature and science. And I find myself thinking a lot about how music, art, literature, they're emotionally moving. Um, I listen to music and I love the music in that moment. And I want to listen to more of it. I think with science, there's a often a bit of a lift to understand the impact that science has. In my, in my vision of this work, we have a world that values science because it's wonderful and amazing and has profoundly affected who we are and what we do and how we live together on this planet. Laura Lindenfeld is the executive director of the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University and dean of Stony Brook's School of Communication and Journalism. Our extended conversation about the fine art of science communication can be found in the June issue of Food Technology. Cultivated Meat got a big boost earlier this year when two companies, Eat Just Incorporated and Upside Foods, were given regulatory clearance to sell their cell-based chicken in the United States. Food Technologies' Kelly Hensel spoke to Josh Tetrick, CEO and co-founder of Eat Just, about this milestone, as well as the uphill battle cultivated meat companies still face. Thanks for joining me today, Josh. So back in May, you were speaking at the Qatar Economic Forum, and you mentioned that Good Meats Cultivated Chicken is being sold in a butcher shop in Singapore. I know since then that it's also debuted at Jose Andres restaurant in Washington, D.C. So obviously, both of these instances are very historical, given that, you know, it's the first time cultivated meat has been sold anywhere in the world. But I think there's also, it becomes obvious that there's a long way to go in terms of the scale and the reach that you guys want to achieve. But I was wondering, despite that limited distribution that you've had so far, what have some of the key learnings been from from those experiences? We have learned that, thankfully, people think it tastes like chicken. We've learned that people are really curious, even more so than we thought about the process. We've learned that young people under the age of 30 could care less if their meat is made in a stainless steel vessel. They almost think it's like odd that it would be odd. And we've learned that scaling cultivated meat is going to be extremely hard. Um, and we're at, you know, a, a interesting place as a company in that, you know, a lot of the milestones that we were looking at years ago uh, in wanting to achieve getting regulatory approval first in the world, getting FDA approval, getting USD approval, selling in the United States, sell density, media costs, check, 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 check. We've done it. But the biggest one is before us. And that is how do you truly scale cultivated meat production? And our definition of scale, which might be different than how other companies define it, is not hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's tens of millions of pounds really just think sufficient scale for national distribution across the U.S. in the way just a regular person thinks of it. And that's going to require 
hundreds of millions of dollars of capital. It's going to require solving a lot of engineering uh, challenges, um, and it's going to require a lot of time. And it is uh, without question uncertain whether we'll be able to do it. You mentioned the the obvious need for capital investment in your talk at the Qatar Economic Forum. And I was wondering, you know, obviously that was back in May and you guys have, um, you're in Singapore and you're in the United States now in a restaurant. Have those introductions drawn enough attention to make a difference in terms of capital investment thus far? Are you seeing a positive trajectory, I guess? Yeah, I mean, there's quite a bit of interest, but I would I would distinguish millions, tens of millions from many hundreds of millions. And it's the many hundreds of millions that's required to build out a large scale facility. That's what that is really what is required. And that's to come. Now, I was curious about why did you, the company, decide to launch in the United States via food service, obviously at a restaurant run by Jose Andres, who's obviously really well known, and this is something that he's passionate about, as opposed to going through retail channels in Singapore? What was the strategy there? There are two reasons. One is both in Singapore and in the United States, we've wanted to partner with uh, both locally renowned chefs and globally renowned chefs. So even the room that I'm speaking to you in now is named Mr. Luz, who is a locally renowned chef in Singapore. He runs a hawker stand called Mr. Luz. He makes a really good Chinese chicken curry rice, which he's been selling for 50 years. And obviously, Jose I'm just a bit more well-known. Um, and so that's one reason. And the second reason is retail just doesn't make sense from a capacity perspective because it'd be a bit odd to like be in one store once a week. So it's just, that'd be goofy. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So is the plan to then kind of, obviously this is going to take a while, like you said, it's going to take time to kind of stay in slowly increased capacity at, at restaurants, at food service locations with Jose perhaps, or other, other, you know, well-known establishments. What's the like five-year, 10-year plan? I think there are, you could separate this into like four different courses, like to use a food analogy, but we'll start off with the appetizer. Like the appetizer is just, you can taste it in the lab. And we've been doing that for years and other companies do a great job of that, right? Cultivated meat is real, right? It's there, it's in the lab, you can try it, it tastes nice, right? First course is actually getting approval and selling for the first time in the world in Singapore. Small volumes, but you know what? You need to put out your credit card to buy it. It's in a commercial setting, right? There's actually a commercial transaction happening there. Makes it a lot more real, right? Third course, no offense to Singapore, is to do it in the world's largest economy because that amps up the credibility of this with one of the most globally renowned chefs in the world. Again, still small. Fourth course, I'm actually, I'm going to have five courses to this. Fourth course is actually making tens of millions of pounds of it. And to make tens of millions of pounds of it, we need to allocate hundreds of millions of dollars. And that'll be a two to five year project, depending on how good we are, to actually get a large scale facility stood up and running. Final course, hopefully before I die, <laughs> is that the vast majority of the meat that's consumed in the world doesn't require the slaughter of a single animal. I love that analogy. It works. Yeah. So in out of curiosity, is is chicken, you started with chicken. Is there a reason that you guys decided to go with chicken as opposed to beef? I'm sure there is. What 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 was that you know decision like? You know, it, there's two reasons. One is chicken is the most consumed animal um, meat product. Mm -hmm. Um uh, pork is a close second and then beef. And then the second was it just happened pretty, pretty randomly that the chicken cell lines that we have, we had the, a particular chicken cell was just performing the best. So we said, all right, let's go with it. But we're, we're as passionate about beef. We have a number of beef cell lines. We've scaled up uh, one of them and a thousand liters. We are, um, 
in a place we're going to submit our beef application to uh, regulatory authorities somewhere before the end of the year. So you should really think of the, for the most part, the infrastructure that you're building for chicken is relevant for beef, is relevant for pork. It almost would be like uh, if it was an electric car manufacturing facility. Most of that infrastructure is relevant whether you're doing a sedan or a sports car. There's some tweaks with the feed, with the but much of it is 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 pretty similar. You kind of talked about um, where you guys are headed in the next five years, ten years. I'm I'm just thinking back to like 2013 when Mark Post introduced that really expensive burger that he had a tasting of in London. And, and cultivated meat has come so far so quickly, it seems like, but obviously there's this big hurdle um, in terms of investment and, and infrastructure. Where do you hope, not just you know you guys, but in general cultivated meat to be and its impact to have by like 2030? Before I answer that, I would just say that cultivated meat, um, should absolutely be looked at and no one should ever join a cultivated meat company or start one if you are not fully prepared for a lifetime project. So I'll just start there. Um, and 2030 is too short, <laughs> right? So you really have to think in terms of like lifetimes and even honestly past your lifetime with cultivated meat. If you didn't, you wouldn't even do it. Right. Because that's how long term it really is. Um, 2030. I could see our company and other companies having one or more facilities up producing tens of millions of pounds of product. With national distribution by 2030. Still much less than one percent. Yeah. All the meat consumed in the world. But another step right? Towards people. I think um, what's really hard for, I think all of us to wrap our brains around is that, you know, when the cell phone was first introduced in the mid forties, right? It was this giant cell phone and everyone made fun of it. And, and that was, you know, 70 or so years ago, that's how long it's taken, you know, for the cell phone to, be ubiquitous and it's still not owned by every person in the world we get we get used to these things very quickly and i think the same thing at some point will happen with cultivated meat i love that i love that um comparison because you're right i think we lose track of how long some of these other technologies were actually around before they were ubiquitous you know a friend of mine might say i i read this person criticizing cultivated meat and they said that the costs are way too high right now and the technology is going to have difficulty being scaled and it's not necessarily going to happen in the next decade. <laughs> well, My answer is, that's all true. Yeah, exactly. Sounds pretty right to me. <laughs> yeah. but you, what you, can, you can hear that and just be like, all right, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> right. You know? Give up. Okay. <laughs> right. or, or you can hear that and say, okay, let's try to as best we can increase the probability that we're able to get it done, knowing that we're never, ever going to get to 100%, right? right? But we can make it more likely. And that's a really good thing. Josh Tetrick is co-founder and CEO of Eat Just, the maker of good meat cultivated chicken. Visit ift.org and check out our archives to read more about cultivated meat and its potential to help the food industry reduce its carbon footprint in the September issue of Food Technology. Helena, a biotech company specializing in precision fermentation, took the top prize at a startup pitch competition during the IFT First annual event and expo in July. Helena uses precision fermentation to convert breast milk proteins into ingredients such as lactoferrin, with purported benefits to regulate iron levels, improve nutrient absorption, and support cognitive health. After the event, Associate Editor Emily Little spoke with Helena's Chief Operating Officer, Paula Delgado, 
about the potential of precision fermentation and how the company plans to invest the prize winnings. Paola, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, Emily. So first of all, congratulations on winning the pitch at this year's IFT First. Uh, It was unexpected. Uh, I think that there were a lot of great uh, companies uh, talking about their businesses. It was my first time at the conference, so it was a nice treat to be able to bring that home. What a way to start your first time at IFT First. (laughs) (laughs) So could you talk a little bit about what is Helena and what is Helena offering to its customers? Absolutely. So Helena, we are actually a consumer biotech company, and we are creating human milk bioactive proteins to be used as food ingredients to fuel and make foods that support a longer health span. Um, As I mentioned during the pitch, our first protein is human lactoferrin, which is a multifunctional molecule found in uh, colostrum and human milk that regulate iron levels, improves nutrient absorption, and supports cognitive health. And we are creating these novel ingredients, harnessing the power of precision fermentation. And why precision fermentation? Why is that the route that you all chose to go down? So a few things. Maybe it would be good if I start like, what what is precision fermentation, right? And let's take one step back even to that. And it's like, what is fermentation? Fermentation is a natural process where microorganisms are present in the food, on a food, on a food host, quote unquote, break down the existing food structures, uh, effectively creating a new food with unique characteristics and flavors. This process has been used for thousands of years in an array of different cultures to create foods like joggers, kimchi, sauerkraut, just all, all, all these different types of new foods that they are part of our everyday uh, life. Uh, precision fermentation, uh, what we do is instead of letting the fermentation process happen organically, we select a microorganism. In the case of Kalena, this is yeast, and program this yeast to produce um, specific proteins during the fermentation proteins, uh, d- d- during the fermentation process. In our case, these proteins are human bioactive proteins. After that, we allow this yeast to grow in an ideal control environment called a bioreactor, which fosters the fermentation process and allows the yeast to give birth to Helena's human lactoferrin, to turn into Helena's human lactoferrin. So this technique that has been used for thousands of years has evolved into giving us as human endless possibility for the manufacture of proteins that were previously available only through animal sources or human sources or sources that only had limits on scale, really. And what is very special about Helena is that we have very, very smart group of scientists that uh, have figured out a way to turn a uh, yeast into a precision fermentation platform that can be programmed to create all types, different types of human bioactives, um, which are which are compounds uh, very well documented to give benefits to an array of human function supporting just overall a longer health span for humans. And what kind of markets are you looking to break into first with this lactoferrin? We actually are going to market on three verticals, uh, sports nutrition, uh, women's health, and also elderly nutrition. And a lot of these markets have been by looking at what are the specific benefits that lactoferrin delivers to each of these population? And then just looking at the early adopter 
and who who and why would they consume this and just having a lot of conversations with potential customers. <laughs> So I remember during your pitch, you spoke about your personal connection with seeing Anemia firsthand. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that influences your work at Helena? I grew up in Peru and Peru nowadays people see it as a somehow developed country. You know, everyone, Machu Picchu wants to come visit. But when I was growing up, it was the early 90s and you had a lot of poverty 40% underemployment, and people just basically didn't have food to eat. And my mom was a nutritionist in a food kitchen. So she would actually make the mixtures to try to deliver the most nutritional value uh, at a very, very low cost because these were funded by the government to whomever, very poor people that would come and try to eat. And I, th- there was a lot of malnutrition and anemia and women especially, because in Peru also a highly Catholic country, just women have like four, five, six children, mm-hmm. right? They were very tired and they didn't have like a lot of energy. And it, it just felt like all the odds were against them. First of all, they were very poor. They were women. They were not, they had a lot of children. They didn't have uh, the strength to do something else really, or to work harder or even try to, to, to just make a better life for themselves. So everything was a little bit of a, a trickle down effect. Right. And then, you know, very interestingly, uh, and just Peru, for some reason, it has one of the highest incidences of anemia in their population uh, as a as a country on a per capita basis, so which to me, it, it was just very interesting. So when I first met Laura and I first uh, heard about lactoferrin and human bioactive proteins and how they basically interact with the body to deliver iron in an optimized way, Right. And I'm not going to get all science geeky because I'm not a scientist, but like I love what we are doing. And that could be the liver at a scale. It was something that really was really meaningful to me. Right. So and I met Laura for six months before we even decided to work together. So it's, you know, once what what when there is an idea that you keep going back to you know, you need to, at least I needed to follow my heart on that. Mm -hmm. That's great. I love that you, you know, like you said, you followed your heart and, you know, now you guys have won $10,000 from the Seeding the Future Foundation. What are your plans for using that prize money? So this funding will like help advance our goal of bringing these bioactive ingredients to market and they actually come at a very pivotal time for the company because uh, we have recently a scale, have several fermentation runs at commercial scale, which is, which in our case is 45,000 liters. And we are actually in the process of partnering, looking to partner with new brands to so that they would be interested in launching uh, our lactoferrin in their products. Great. Well, Paola, thank you so much for talking with me and good luck with Helena in the future. Thank you so much, Emily. It was a pleasure. Paula Delgado is Chief Operating Officer of Helena. You can read more about the pitch competition and other highlights from this year's IFT First event in the September issue of Food Technology. This episode of Omnivore has been sponsored by IFT's new Product Development Bootcamp, a comprehensive 10-module online course designed to equip food and beverage professionals with the knowledge and skills necessary to elevate and accelerate product development. Learn more at ift.org bootcamp. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. 
If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.